Okay, you see what it says there in the uh, four sections, the four major sections of the book of Jeremiah. There, there are 52 chapters. We are to section four, which is con the conclusion of the book of Jeremiah. Uh, we begin today chapter 52. Now, as we go into this, chapter 52 is nearly identical to 2 Kings 24, starting in verse 18, through 2 Kings 25, verse 30. What that means is that it was written sometime after 561 B.C. That is when, and we'll see that in chapter 52, when King Jehoiachin, you remember Jehoiachin, we'll go over it in a minute, I'll show you the graphic, but he's the grandson of Josiah that, that ruled for three months and then was taken to Babylon. Now, he was in prison in Babylon for 37 years. Uh, he was taken to Babylon in 598, 597, depending on the calendar, and he gets out uh, in 561. So he's in prison 37 years until Nebuchadnezzar died and his son uh, the, the Hebrew form of his son's name was Evil Murdoch, uh, which sounds like a character in a Charles Dickens play. But uh, when Evil Murdoch becomes king of Babylon, he releases Jehoiachin. Now, whoever wrote that um, has used that as the conclusion, has edited the book of Jeremiah, and added that, I, well, it may, it may not be whoever wrote it. It may be just an editor who has that. I don't know which came first. Most likely the Second Kings history uh, was there, and it was added to Jeremiah in order to give a, uh, an epilogue to the book of Jeremiah. Now, it overlaps quite a bit with, uh, chapter 39, where Zedekiah was taken to Babylon later. Um, so let's let's move forward here. Much of the much of the material is parallel to the information recorded by Jeremiah in chapter 39 uh, with King Zedekiah. Why then, if so, if it's repeat material, why would this be added to Jeremiah's prophecy? What was the thinking? Most likely. It was to show that Jeremiah's words of judgment against Jerusalem had come to fulfillment. All right? It was added by a later writer saying, you know what? Things happened just the way Jeremiah predicted that they would happen. And that Jeremiah's words about Judah's release. So this is being written uh, most likely while the, while the captives are still in Babylon. And this is a word of hope to them, showing that Jeremiah predicted that, that you would go into exile, and that has happened. He also predicted that you would come back from exile to give them hope to keep carrying on and not getting overwhelmed. Many Jews, I think, disappeared in Babylon. They became Babylonians. They lost their connection with God. They lost their connection with Israel. Or they forgot about it and just tried to move on. In the same, that is what happened to most of the ten tribes of Israel that were taken into Assyrian captivity in 722. They've just disappeared into the sea of humanity. And, you know, we have talked about the decreasing size of the Bible Belt, the decreasing size of the churches, that's what's kind of happening to a lot of the people that grew up going to church. They're disappearing into the sea of people, Faye? Well, I think the reason most of them didn't go back to Jerusalem was they knew Jerusalem was tore up and burned it, up. It was, a, it was an had, awful place. They had already settled down. And got they had got home. used to big city life. Yeah. They knew where their stuff was. And so it wasn't necessarily a bad intent. It was more a thing of convenience. I think, I think you're right. And I think getting back to the, you know, people stopping going to church, it's, it's a lot, you know, 
A lot of people stopped going for COVID because it was dangerous. They found out, golly, Sunday morning is a real nice morning to sleep in. I have to confess. Can I confess? Can I testify? It was nice to get up at 8 on Sunday morning. That just hadn't happened a lot in my adult life. When COVID, those eight weeks that we didn't have church, I'd get up and I'd drink me a cup of coffee and I'd kind of mosey about. Now, me and Ellie and Sarah would have, I would take our our Bible study, you know, I was putting the Bible study online. Uh, I'd take our Bible study and I would, uh, no, no, I'm sorry. I would take our the sermon, I was putting the sermon online during COVID. I'd take that sermon and I would kind of preach them a little mini sermon. We'd have about a 20 or 30 minute Bible study slash sermon. And then I'd watch football. And that was kind of nice. Now, it came time to start church back. You know, and we had to get our, our system back used to it. And so I do think a lot of people um, found that it was nice to have a little more control of their Sunday morning and, and get some rest and do the things. And, and it's not, that's not evil per se. It's not a person doing evil. It just carries a certain danger with it, doesn't it? And I think staying in Babylon carried a certain danger that they were going to lose their spiritual identity in Yahweh. And if not them, probably that generation that was taken captive, though they had, you know, it was a generation that had already turned its back on God, but maybe that generation that went to captivity didn't really lose their identity with Yahweh. But what about their kids? They're, do you think they were teaching their kids, we're going to go back to Jerusalem, the city of God. We're going to go back and we're going to live a life of purpose and a life that pleases Yahweh. My guess is they did. And so there's, I think there are some points of connection here. This chapter 52 is the final chapter. Uh, it served to vindicate Jeremiah the prophet and encourage the remnant who is still in captivity. Don't lose your identity. Don't lose your hope. If Jeremiah predicted the captivity, and that's come to be, he also predicted that we would return, that we would go back to Jerusalem. That's still our goal, is to get back to Jerusalem. So chapter 52, um, it is section four. So as I said, we've divided, the outline divided Jeremiah into four sections. This is the final section. And the first part of this chapter is the fate of Jerusalem, first 23 verses. With the first section of that, the first 11 sections, the fall of Zedekiah, Zedekiah being the last king. Verse 1, it says Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king. I tell you what, I did not know which end was up at age 21, but I thought I did. So probably if you ask Zedekiah, he probably thought he... He could be a great king at age 21, but that's a lot of weight on a man's shoulder. They were paying tribute. They had been uh, conquered, and he had been installed as king by a conqueror who had, who had laid siege to Jerusalem and had come in, broke in. He reigned for 11 years till he was 32 in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hamutal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. So just uh, giving some background information on him. Now, let's review. This will probably be the last time that we will review the last kings of Israel, so pay good attention so you can do good on your quiz about this. The last kings of Judah, well, we go back to old Josiah. Josiah was a good king, and he started ruling in 640 B.C. And just to, just to give you a, a little bit of context, the northern kingdom of, of Israel had been gone for 82 years at the time. Assyria had taken it. Now, Assyria was in its last uh, little bit. Probably when, when Josiah became king, Assyria was a little bit of a worry still. But they quickly deteriorated. They, it, Assyria kind of imploded. Assyria had conquered too much territory. 
and it overextended and the the distant kingdoms were starting to fight back so they were sending troops in every direction in their kingdom and it, it was really weakening uh, Assyria's control in the void in that void Babylon the city-state of Babylon was really beginning to strengthen for Josiah and if you remember Assyria made a coalition army with Egypt so Egypt down to the southeast and Assyria to the north I'm sorry southwest and Assyria to the north came together to fight against Babylon who is rising in 609 and so the Egyptians were coming up the coast of Israel and they got up to the port of Akko it's called Akko now it is the only port in um, the only port in Israel most likely they were going there to get they were probably met there by ships bringing supplies to them and then there is a there is a the Jezreel Valley goes from the Gulf of Akko in towards the heart heartland of Israel well Josiah went up went up through Shechem probably and out to Jezreel Valley and tried to block them there at Megiddo. Megiddo is a mountain uh, that sits right there at the crossroad of that coastal highway and that Jezreel Valley. That e Egypt was on its way to meet at Carchemish with the Syrian army. And of course, Necho II was the pharaoh, uh, the, the pharaoh general. And they defeated Judah. And Josiah was fleeing. He was shot with an arrow. Uh, and killed well he had had four sons so let's review his four sons the first son was Johanan Johanan is only mentioned in history and in the Bible in first Chronicles 315 as the oldest son of Josiah that's the only mention of him second was Eliakim who will become when he becomes king of Judah Jehoiakim the third son was Mataniah, who stayed Mataniah until he was appointed king by Nebuchadnezzar. And then he took the name Zedekiah, which means uh, Yahweh is righteous. Yahweh is, is, is just. And then the fourth son, his name was Shalom. Uh, when he became king, uh, he, his name was changed. To Jehoiahaz. Now, let's look at them becoming kings. So it was Shalom, son number four. I'm going to walk back and forth because my watch just buzzed and told me I need about 90 steps. Um, Shalom was son number four, and he was appointed king by Necho. Why did Necho pick him? We don't know. It doesn't say. But he was only he did something after three months that Necho did not like. Necho uh, took him took him to Egypt and he died in prison in Egypt. He may have been executed. I'm not exactly sure. Faye, do you know what happened to Jehoiahaz? I think he died in prison in Egypt. Then the second king was the second son, we don't know what happened to Johanan, but the second son who is Eliakim and his name when he became, that first part, that Jeho, that is Yahweh, that's a contraction of the name uh, Yahweh. Um, Jehoiakim uh, was king and he reigned in Jerusalem for 11 years, you see there, approximately 11 years. And he was not a very good king as according to the Bible. He did a lot of building projects. He 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 predict he pretended like everything was okay. They were threatened um, by Nebuchadnezzar in 605. Uh, they fought the Battle of Carchemish while he was king. Um, Babylon defeated Assyria and Egypt in that battle, and um, then he turned. Nebuchadnezzar turned his attention on, well, I believe 
in 605, it was still Nablo-Plazer, who was Nebuchadnezzar's dad. So I believe it was around 603, 602 that Nebuchadnezzar actually became the king of Babylon. Anyway, in 597, they had, they had, Jerusalem had become a vassal state uh, after Carchemish had become a vassal state of Babylon and started paying tribute. Um, then Nebuchadnezzar went back to Babylon to secure his throne. Jehoiakim thought that he was gone for good, so he stopped paying the tribute. Nebuchadnezzar came in 597, laid siege, and as, when they knew that Jehoiakim had rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar was coming to get him, all of a sudden Jehoiakim died. Most people think, the Bible does not say, but most people kind of think that Jehoiakim was assassinated uh, when, that, when Nebuchadnezzar was coming. So they could say, it was all Jehoiakim, don't punish us for what he did. But we don't know exactly. So when Nebuchadnezzar came, he made Josiah's grandson, and this is very important, and I'll show you why in a minute, uh, made Josiah's grandson Jehoiachin, who was also known as Jeconiah, and Jeconiah was, so he was probably grew up Jeconiah, and it, they called him Coniah for short, Coniah. When he became king, Jehoiachin, they changed his name and put that Yahweh at the, uh, Yehu at the front of his name. Now he was appointed by Nebuchadnezzar and he was king for three months like his uncle was. And then Nebuchadnezzar took him to Babylon after that and put him in prison. Not sh I, Again, I'm not exactly sure why he, he did that. But he's important for a lot of reasons. One reason is we have archaeological evidence of him being in Babylon, validating what the Bible says. He's called Jeconiah, and um, they have a, a round cylinder with writing on it, which is one of the way they did it. It's made out of stone. Might have might have been clay and imprinted. I'm not sure. But anyway, it talks about his food provisions. The, the food, it was like a, a grocery list, for his household, the provisions that Babylon was supplying, and we have found that. Uh, so confirmation of him. Another way that he is important is he is the ancestor of Jesus. We'll look a minute uh, in a minute in Matthew and see uh, the line of descendancy, the seed of promise going from the, the woman and, and Adam and his woman, uh, all the way back in Genesis that we've tracked, all the way through the Old Testament, goes through Jeconiah. He is the survivor of Josiah's family. Everybody else uh, is killed or dies in prison. So then he is taken to Babylon, and then Uncle Mataniah is appointed by Nebuchadnezzar, he reigns for 11 years in Jerusalem. His name is changed to Zedekiah. And, and so just that name Zedekiah, not sure who gave him that name, but I will point out the I-A-H is what, how you see Yahweh put on the end of a name. That is Yahweh. So the right, Zedek, Zadik is righteousness. Zadikiah is righteousness of Yahweh, okay? So just like Jeremiah, Jer the I-A-H, Isaiah, I-A-H, um, when that is on the end of a word, that is the word Yahweh on a name. When it's put on the front, it looks more like Jehu, okay? So all of these kings were given a name, a kingly name uh, with Yahweh in it. Okay, so that's those kings. So we pick up again uh, with Zedekiah in verse 2. Ze Zedekiah also did evil in the sight of the Lord according to all that Jehoiakim had done. And so Jehoiakim had done evil, had been 
had ignored the crisis, the spiritual crisis it was in, and tried to do building projects and things. And, and that is the way that people can do sometimes when things begin unraveling. Um, they try to do things that they can control rather than trying to fix difficult things like the spiritual thing. And like Judah was turning away from God, and rather than Jehoiakim trying to make reforms like his father Josiah had done, he turned away from spiritual concerns and started trying to build buildings, uh, hoping, I guess, that, that, that that would fix things, but more likely hoping that it would make him great. Uh, Zedekiah was similar. Zedekiah rebelled against. Zedekiah, rather than trusting God, uh, seemed like he tried to trust his neighbors, uh, the other nations around him, to resist Babylon. Uh, now, as we went through Jeremiah, I'd always had a bad impression of Zedekiah, but Zedekiah was actually probably the most kind, other than Josiah, to Jeremiah, the most understanding. And, you know, Zedekiah met him out behind the temple one time at the gate and said, listen, Jeremiah, I'm, I'm, if you do this, I'm not going to be able to protect you. You need to calm down and let me hide you. You know, so several times Zedekiah tried to help Jeremiah. However, Zedekiah was not um, strong in the Lord, and he was not brave uh, and a defender of the Lord, but he was sympathetic to Jeremiah. Okay? I could see that you wanted to say something. Well, uh, I, I can remember reading that uh, Egypt didn't have a bone to pick with Josiah, but he just came out and got He did. Away. He got in the way. And I believe in Chronicles, I believe it says Josiah did that on his own. God didn't tell him to do it. Mm -hmm. So, so I don't know what happened there. I don't know what happened. It doesn't really say what happened with Josiah. I think it is a historical fact that Josiah went and block, tried to block Necho and got killed. And I, I think it was a mystery to the Bible authors why he did that. I, I don't think anybody knows. Uh, so Zedekiah did evil in the sight of the Lord in the same way that Jehoiakim had. For because of the anger of the Lord, this happened in Jerusalem and in Judah, till he finally cast them out of his presence. Jerusalem and Judah turned their back on God. And so going all the way, going very tightly back to the book of Deuteronomy, Moses warned the people as they were getting ready to cross the, uh, the, the Jordan River into the promised land. If you turn your back on God, he will send a nation to sweep you away. If you begin worshiping the idols of the people around you, God will sweep you away. And it's almost, you know, it's very close to what actually happened. Moses, way back to old Moses, predicted that this would happen. Till he finally cast them out of his presence. Then Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. If you remember from earlier in Jeremiah, God sent counsel to Zedekiah and said, you need to not resist Babylon. Don't resist. Don't rebel. Um, God will preserve you. And just like Ahaz with, with um, Isaiah, Zedekiah re refused to listen to the counsel of the Lord. Now it came to pass... In the ninth year, so he reigned 11 years total, in the ninth year of his reign, very specifically in the 10th month, on the 10th day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and his army came against Jerusalem and encamped against it. And they built a siege wall against Jerusalem and all around. Are, are several siege walls. Uh, they would they would pile dirt against against the fortress walls so that 
so that the troops could just march up and walk over the wall. Uh, and so these siege walls were very threatening. And so they would have to put 24 hours, they would have to have soldiers there were shields waiting for the attack, never knowing when it would come. So the city was besieged until the 11th year of King Zedekiah. For, so for two years, I believe when we looked at it earlier in, I believe it was Jeremiah chapter 39, I believe it was 30 months. So two and a half years, this siege went on. By the fourth month, of the ninth day of the month, the famine had become so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land, which makes sense. After two and a half years, can you imagine how much food you would have to store in your house for two and a half years? Then the city wall was broken through. And, it, and going back to from before, it was, the, they believe, the middle gate on the northern wall. So if you remember the city of David, the Temple Mount and the city of David, which kind of comes down into a point, and then they had built out to the west, they had built a big, uh, the biggest part of Jerusalem by the time of Zedekiah was out to the west. And so the city of David was just a little strip. It was the gate on the northern end in the middle of that extension out. The city wall was broken through, and all of the men of war fled and went out of the city by way of the gate between the two walls, which was by the king's garden, even though the Chaldeans were near the city all around, and they went by way of the plain. So there's a picture of them attacking from the north, and you see they have a siege tower there. Um, they're not showing any of the siege walls here, where they build a mound of dirt up against it. I'm, but I'm pretty sure going back to chapter 39, they talked about the siege walls being there. But that is a tower that they would roll up against it. And so it'd have a lot of troops on it. And they would be fighting face to face with the men on top of the wall. Uh, that is a battering ram right there against the gate. Uh, and they would have a roof on it so they couldn't throw rocks down on them and shoot them with arrows. And they were just swinging that, battering that gate. Can you imagine... Can you imagine the fear uh, inside that wall as you would hear them battering that wall? And you would hear the screams of the, the men. You would hear the chariots. You would hear the horses winning and the men screaming. They got a ladder going up there, up a tower. After a 30 month siege, the Babylonians broke through the city wall. The officials of Babylon entered the city and took seats in the middle gate. That's why they, they it tells it tells in Jeremiah 39 that they were in the middle gate, uh, and that's why they believe that was the one that was breached. The middle gate was probably on the north side of the city where the ba Babylonians breached the walls in the central valley, which separated the two quarters of the city. Let's see, I've got a little map here. Okay, so... The, that little map shows the archaeology of where they believe the middle gate was. So what the remains of the Hasmonean walls, Hasmonean walls were about 150, 160 years before Jesus, so way later. That was about 400 years later. An older wall, they found the remains of the middle gate, and all that's left, all they found was that in black there and then a little piece over there. You see there have been other walls built over top of it. So they found these walls down under the ground. Uh, and those are the, all the, the little black parts are the fragments that they found digging in the ground. Uh, and the dotted part is where they believe the rest of the gates was. They took seats to establish control of the city. So the, the elders of a city or a town would sit in the city gate and have court, hold court um, in the ancient world. And so this sitting in the city gate and judging means to demonstrate that they are now the authority in the law. And so that's what they think 
based on the archaeology that the gate would look like. And that, that is the way of building a gate for defense uh, against the enemies. So meanwhile, Zedekiah, so it was, and this is going back to 39, uh, a verse that, that fills in a little gap. So it was when Zedekiah and all his men of war saw that the Babylonians had breached the wall, they fled and went out of the city by night by way of the king's garden, by the gate between the two walls, and went out by way of the plain. Uh, the plan was to leave the city by way of the king's garden that's located in the south near the pool of Siloam. So if you're imagining Jerusalem, the, the temple mount up here where the temple is, uh, up on what was before the temple was built, Mount Moriah, and then it, the city of David comes down into a point. And so the pool of Siloam is down there in the point of the city. As I said, Jerusalem had built out to the west here and was actually, there was more there at the time of Zedekiah than in the city of David. And so the pool of Siloam was down at the bottom in the old, so when it says the two quarters, that is the old city of David quarter and then the new quarter would be the, the, the part out to the west. The ragtag group of soldiers were in a steep ravine where Hinnom and Kidron Valleys unite. So, City of David, the big western extension, the Valley of ben Hinnom curves around like that, and it is a ravine. You may remember we've seen pictures of it today, and it just is a big drop-off down in that valley. The Kidron Valley is the valley that goes up on the eastern side from north to south. That is the valley. Uh, they would always come out of the southern gate generally, and cross the Kidron Valley uh, south of Jerusalem and then walk up the hill to the Mount of Olives. That is the pathway that Jesus took on his triumphal entry. It is also the pathway when, when King David fled from his son, uh, Absalom, he did that same trail crossing down in the southern, cam, coming out of the bottom and going up and going up the road and up climbing the hills up to the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives sits above Jerusalem, and you kind of look down at Jerusalem from there. Uh, climbing over the Mount of Olives, the army headed towards Arabah, probably hoping to cross the Jordan and escape to Rabbah, which is in modern-day Jordan, Amman, Jordan, the capital of their allies, the Ammonites. And so there is a map. And it would be a route, uh, you see Jerusalem starred right there in the middle. And it would be something like that route to go to Rabbah uh, of Ammon. Okay, so there is what I've been talking about. Um, this, this part on the right side is the the old city, the southern part is the city of David, um, and the part up at the top is where the temple was, the Temple Mount. All that out to the west was the new quarter of the city. Probably about right here is the middle gate where they came in. Uh, you see the Pool of Siloam down there at the foot of the city. That's where they went out. There is the temple. That is probably where they exited, as I said. This is the Valley of ben Hinnon down here, going like that and wrapping around the city. And then they went up. There's a road that they go up and out through the Mount of Olives. Okay. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king. They overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. All his army was scattered from him. So they took the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon at Riblah in the land of Amoth, and he pronounced judgment on Zedekiah. Then the king of Babylon killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes. He had five sons. Um, he was about 32, so they were probably fairly young, probably none of them older than 10 to 12 at the most. 
and he killed all the princes of Judah, all the nobles uh, at, in Ribla. He also put out the eyes of Zedekiah, so he let him watch the execution of his young son, and then he poked his eyes out. So that would be the last thing that he saw. And the king of Babylon bound him in bronze fetters, took him to Babylon, and put him in prison till the day of his death. So I think that's probably a good place to, to stop for today. Uh, they get, we'll pick up there in verse 11 as they go to burn and destroy Jerusalem uh, next week. So any questions about this? This is a little bit, in some ways, this is a little bit of a recap of stuff we've already talked about. But you can see how it is an important conclusion to show that Jeremiah had warned. I mean, the book of Jeremiah, most of it is Jeremiah warning Jerusalem. Judgment day is coming. And so someone has taken that king's account and put it on the end. As they read it in Babylon, they say Jeremiah was a man of God, a prophet of God. Heed his warning. He warned that this would happen. It's happened. He also warned that God has not forgotten us. And so we can, we can, as our spiritual lesson, we can complain about the world. We can feel overwhelmed by the world. But let me say to you, God has not gone to sleep. God is working a plan, and he is not surprised the world is the way it is. That said, is God okay for Christian people to just wring their hands and, and be in a panic? No. No. We are always called to the same behavior. If things are good in America, if people are behaving, we are called to shine the light of Christ. If things, when things get bad, we are called to shine the light of Christ. We are to know what we believe. We're to be able to articulate what we believe. We're to be people of prayer and people of scripture. Doesn't matter what's going on. Same thing was true in the time of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was meant to be a hope for the people of faith in Babylon, even though it looked like their whole world had come to an end. And I think there's a good lesson for us in that. Any questions or comments as we close? They didn't have no mercy on anybody, did they? It wasn't a merciful time. It wasn't a merciful time. And you know, people today, uh, we've gotten more civil in some ways. You know, we see that old savagery come up frequently but in general thing even warfare is more civil now and less personal than it used to be and people want to look back in the bible the bible was formed in a time when people acted like this when you were when you got conquered you got wiped out you got brutalized and it it was bad to be a man when you got conquered you were probably going to be killed as a man. It was way worse to be a woman in, in Bible times. And so the language of the Bible, a lot of the language of the Bible talks about God as a warrior, God who protects, God who takes vengeance on his enemies. And modern people have trouble, especially because they're not really reading the Bible. They're picking out things to not like. But they have a lot of issue with God being described as a warrior. But you know, you think about if we lived in a constant threat of an army sweeping through and killing all the men and killing all the women once they were past childbearing age, they would be killed because they served no purpose. And all the young women and all the little boys and little girls to be taken as slaves. You would want a God who could swing a sword. You would think, because that would be something important to you. People that criticize the harshness of the speech about God in the Old Testament have the luxury of living in a safe society to make that criticism. And so they don't, if they're bothering to read, generally they're not understanding what they're reading, but they, they are in a safe place to think negatively about God. 
they would want, if they lived under the threat of what we've read about today, uh, they would want a God that could protect them. And they would want to use language about God. So, good point. It was a tough time. Anything else? All right, let's close and say a prayer.